Well, in the famous words of Johnny Cochran, if the puppet doesn't fit, you must acquit. <laughs> uh, good morning. I, I don't know how you follow that. That's, hard, that's a hard act to follow. But if, if you've got your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to turn with me today to John chapter 18. And that's where we're going to be in our, in our series in the Gospel of John, beginning in verse 15 in, in just a moment. Uh, it's sort of fitting that we had the, uh, the Law and Order um, video because my, my introduction sort of ties in with that, a little bit like last week. But uh, uh, everything I learned about the American justice system, I learned from Andy Griffith. And uh, maybe that's a little bit of a naive look at the justice system. Uh, I brought a picture of Andy Harris. I used to go over to my grandpa Marvin's house, and he loved Andy Griffith. And we would watch uh, the Andy Griffith show and Mayberry, you know, black and white, and they shifted to color. It was a big shift, you know, Barney Fife and all that. And then I would also watch with my grandpa another Andy Griffith show. And this one you may be familiar with, a little less famous. It's called Matlock. Anybody seen Matlock? Everybody under the age of 30 or 40 is like, what? Is it a, is it a, is it a deadbolt? Is it a, I don't know. So, but it was a show called Matlock. I brought a picture of Matlock as well today. And if you're not familiar with Matlock, uh, this will sort of fill you in. This is straight from Wikipedia, so you know it's true. Uh, the show centers on, on a widower. His name is Ben Matlock, and he's played by Andy Griffith, and he plays this sort of folksy popular, cantankerous attorney. He studied at Harvard Law, so you know he's, he's, really, he's really worth his money. And he's known to visit crime scenes to discover clues that the, the bumbling police department, the detectives, they, they passed over, they missed. And he has, he's known for his finicky fashion sense, kind of like me. He, he's never seen in public without his gray uh, suit, suit on. I, I tried to get away from that today, so I'm, you know, just breaking out of my shell. It's this, this sort of cheap gray suit. You learn in one of the seasons that he blames Dr. Mark Sloan, who's played by Dick Van Dyke, for costing him his entire life savings of $5,000 in 1969 when he was investing in an eight-track cartridge business, and he lost everything. And so he's condemned to a life of cheap suits and hot dogs. He's always sort of seen eating hot dogs. But the, the big thing about Matlock, if you haven't seen the show, is every episode was basically the same, right? There would be a crime, there would be a trial, and Matlock at the trial would call a witness. And I've never been a witness at a trial, but you kind of, you know how it goes. You, you, you come up to the stand and you have to place your hand on the Bible and you have to, you swear it, you know, you're going to tell the truth and you sit in the seat um, and you answer questions, and you think that you're just being called as a witness. But as you soon learn with Matlock, you are very much a suspect. And every single episode, Matlock would call a witness, and it would just so happen that that witness was the real killer. And so you think you're just there to provide testimony, but you are very much in, in danger. And so from Matlock, I very quickly learned that like to be a witness, to be a witness is a risky proposition. It probably meant you killed somebody. That's what I took away from Matlock. To bear witness could be scary. And some of you probably had to do that at one point or another in a trial setting. It is not fun to be a witness. It can be risky. It can be scary. And for some of us, I think this is one of the reasons um, that there's a little bit of a, a fear about Christianity. To be a Christian is somebody who is supposed to bear witness to Jesus. Being a witness can be scary, whether you're in a trial setting with you're about to get matlocked or whether you're in this sort of the trial setting of life. Being a witness can be scary. We're afraid, whether we want to admit it or not, that somebody is going to matlock us. And we're trying to just testify to what we know to be true or what we've experienced about Jesus, but we're afraid that somebody's going to make us look foolish, that somebody's going to ask us a, a question that, that we don't know the answer to or maybe question our motives, that they're going to put us on the defensive that they're going to start an argument with us or question our, our credibility or maybe even turn us in when we bear witness to Jesus. You think you're just a witness, but you're actually, 
on trial. And it doesn't help that the Greek word in the, in the Bible for bear witness is the word martyr. <laughs> Marturion, to bear witness. It's the word where we get our, our term for those who are, who are killed or martyred for Christ. And so what I want to look at today in a passage that does have to do with the, the criminal justice system in the first century is this very simple question. What does it mean? What does bearing witness look like? What does bearing witness to Christ look like both in our context and in other contexts around the world? What does that look like? to bear witness to, to Jesus. So if you've got your Bible, John chapter 18, beginning in verse 15, I'll read it to you and the words will be on the screen. It says this, Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus because this disciple was known to the high priest. He went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but P Peter had to wait outside the door the other disciple who was known to the high priest came back and spoke to the servant girl on duty there and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter, and he replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews came together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was standing there warming himself, and so they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? And he denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. This is God's word. It ends with the rooster. And this is Fifth Family Sunday. We're going to have a lot of kids in second service. And so one of the things I'm going to do in second service is, is ask this. And in fact, I'll do it here because I see some kids. I need some help. I have forgotten what a rooster sounds like. Can anybody help me with that? Do you know what a rooster sounds like? Can you do that for us? Yes! <laughs> Can anybody else do that? Anybody else know what a rooster sounds like? All right. Yes? You're going to do it? All right, good. That was good. That was very good. I was, that'll work. That'll work. You're not, you're not you know, scared like Peter, apparently. So that's good. Yeah, so one of the contrasts we see in this passage is a contrast between two very short, simple statements. And it's the statement, I am he, which we read last week. Jesus three times says, when he's being asked, you know, who he is, he says, I am he. And it's in the Greek, it's this phrase, ego eimi. And it also could be translated just as I am. The name, of, the name of God, the name of Yahweh in the Old Testament. Jesus is put on the spot and he says truthfully, I am he. Peter is put on the spot. And in the passage we read today, he says repeatedly over and over and over, I am am not. And so the, the title of the message today is very simple. I am he versus I am not. And it's a contrast between Jesus on the one hand, I am he, and Peter on the other. One of them's being honest. One of them is being fearful. Jesus is, is willing to bear witness to who he is. And Peter uh, isn't. It's a kind of matlock moment because Peter knows very well that he's not just being asked to testify, he is being put in the dock and in, in, the, in the threat of sort of potential 
punishment. I don't know how many of you, if you were really honest, you would say that that's been you. That you've had an opportunity to point to Jesus. You've had an opportunity to talk about Jesus. And you've pulled the Peter card. You've basically said, I'm not. (laughs) Maybe even if you just said it on the inside, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put my neck out. I'm not going to talk about Jesus in this way. One of the things I find so relatable about Peter is the exact same guy who just a few verses earlier is swinging a sword to try to defend Jesus in just a few verses is cowering in the presence of a slave girl. And you're like, you wouldn't think that's the same guy. This big fisherman. I picture Peter as like a double XL kind of guy, right? I don't know if you picture Peter like that, but he's swinging a sword in one minute and then the next minute he is denying Jesus to, to a servant girl. And you, and you, could, you could ask this question like, what, what led that to come about? Uh, Matt Chandler is a pastor down in Dallas and he's kind of a big kind of man's man and he tells this story of one time hearing a noise downstairs in his house and going downstairs to like, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm the man of the house, I'm going to protect this house, you know, the Under Armour slogan. And, uh, and a, a child's balloon, like a helium field balloon was, was there just sort of hanging in the stairwell and from a birthday party and the balloon just sort of grazed his face. <laughs> And he went from like, I'm going to protect this house to just sort of, uh, just melting <laughs> in the stairwell at a helium balloon. And I picture, I picture Peter is like, that's exactly the transformation that happens for Peter. And so I want to ask this question. What if we learn about bearing witness to Jesus from the example of, of Peter and from the example of, of Jesus? The first thing I would say is this, bearing witness to Christ pointing to Jesus means that your public self and your private self line up. I'll say it again. Bearing witness to Christ means that your public self, the way you present yourself publicly, and your private self line up. And we see this embodied in Jesus in verse 20. It says this in verse 20. Jesus is is speaking. He says, I have spoken openly to the world. Jesus replied, I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Jesus says, I'm an open book. I haven't tried to hide my agenda. I haven't tried to hide my message. I don't have some sort of hidden, hidden like ulterior motive. I've done all of this in public. Just ask the people who were there and they will tell you what, what I'm all about. My public self and my, my private self line up. I, I think for some of us, if we're honest, our public self gets saved before our private self. Amen? For some of us, our public self gets saved before our private self does. And I think this happens in particular cultures. It happens with particular personality types. It happens in particular in a sort of religious culture, in a culture that is at least ostensibly Christian. Then the tendency is for our our public self to get saved before our private self, because we want people to think that we are good, upstanding Christian citizens. And so we have a temptation to put on a public self that is very Christian, and yet to hide sort of the, the private side of our, of our lives. I heard this quote recently. It's a, it's a common quote. The quote is, dance like nobody is watching, which is, that's the only way I dance. I'll be honest <laughs> is if nobody's watching. The quote, I think I have it up on the screen here, dance like nobody is watching, email like it will be read at a deposition. <laughs> and then I think there's a, there's a next slide here that's important to just keep that in mind. Email like Matlock will be conducting the deposition. There's this side of life that we used to think was private. Private text messages, private emails, And there was this tendency to think that I can conduct this sort of separate life 
right? And no, it's just anonymous. It's completely hidden. And we know today from a wide variety of examples, I don't have to cite the examples because you know the examples of where to quote the scriptures, that which is hidden has been brought to light. Whether it's in a hacked computer, whether it's in a hot mic that was, you know, somebody thought the mic was off and it wasn't off. For some of us, we have this hidden self. Our public self is perfectly willing to point to Jesus, but our, our private self is, is not. And for some of us, our public self and our private self need to, need to realign. For some of us, it's the opposite. For some of us, our public self gets saved before our private self. And the next slide, the next thing you could say is, for some of us, it's our private self. Our private self that is, is willing to engage with Christ, is willing to pray, is willing to pour out our, our needs um, to God, and yet our, priv- our public self is, is fearful. This is, this is Peter. This is Peter. He's in public. He's on the hot seat. He knows he's about to get matlocked, and so his public self shifts. This happens in secular cultures, especially. It happens in anti-Christian environments. It happens in, uh, if you could think about countries where it's not an easy thing to be a Christian. I've talked to friends who do ministry, who are missionaries, who are just uh, native-born individuals in Muslim countries, and they'll say, in many cases, it's, it's not a problem necessarily to convert to Christianity in some of these places. What's a problem is when you get baptized. Because baptism is a very public statement that, that I am publicly identifying with Jesus. And so what you do quietly or in private, maybe you could get away with that, but, but it's the, the public statement that gets you in trouble. Maybe the application or the question we could ask is, is this, what is the difference for you? Think about your own life. Think about your own spiritual journey, not anybody else. What is the difference between your public and your private witness? What is the difference between your public self and your, and your private self. And I'm not talking about just mere boundaries. We all ought to have boundaries before our public and, you know, between our public. I didn't show up today in my fuzzy slippers, you know, and my, like there are differences between private relationships and public, you know, things. But what are the differences between your public and your private witness to, to Jesus? And is there a way in which you need to pull those two parts of your identity together so that our public and our private line up like Jesus. Second observation, I think we see this in the passage as well. Bearing witness to Christ means that the possibility of punishment or of reward doesn't change our testimony. Being a witness, being somebody who points to Jesus, means that the possibility of being punished or the possibility of being rewarded doesn't change your testimony. Verse 25, it says this in the passage. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there. He was warming himself. And so they asked him, you are one of his disciples too, are you? And he denied it. And he said, I am not. We could ask, well, what changed between the garden where Peter is swinging the sword and outside the high priest's residence where Peter is cowering from the helium field balloon, so to speak. Like, what changed between those two settings? And I think the answer is, Peter had time to think about the cost. He had time to think about what it would cost him to stand up for Jesus. In the garden, he is just reacting How many of you are reactive people? (laughs) He is reacting by testosterone alone, to misquote Martin Luther, right? He is just, this is just a visceral, male, defensive, nobody's going to take my buddy, right? And he is brave, misguided in his zeal. We talked about that last week, but he's brave. And so what changes 
in my view, it's the, it's the chance to think about the cost. And it's the same reason why a, why a detective or somebody in the justice system will let a defendant sit there and think about what might happen to them in the holding cell. And they'll recite to them, well, here's what you're going to go down for. Here is the list. Here are the mandatory minimums for each one of these infractions. Just sit there and think about it. And all of a sudden, somebody who said, I will never, I'm not a rat. I'm not going to tell on my buddies. All of a sudden, there's this metamorphosis where they shift because of the threat of, of punishment or because of reward. Um, in fifth grade, we had to do a book report, and it was a big, it was a big deal. Big, really set me on my writing career, I think, you know. And, and we could pick any topic, but it was going to be this big, long paper, and we had to have sources, real sources. The internet wasn't a thing yet. And so we had to turn the paper in in stages to make sure that we were doing our work. And in fifth grade, in a public school in middle of nowhere, Kansas, I chose the topic of, quote, martyrs. <laughs> and I think my, my fifth grade teacher thought, like, he's either going to be a pastor or a serial killer. <laughs> or both. <laughs> because she's like, what do you want to do martyrs? Like, why would you? And I got this book. It was called The Fox's Book of Martyrs, right? And I started reading all these stories about people who had died for their faith. And I have no idea why this was on my radar as a fifth grader. Normally I was, you know, not thinking about uh, martyrdom. Wasn't a big thing in Kansas. But, um, but I remember reading through this book and I got a, a sort of an updated copy here from Voice of the Martyrs right across the street who is sort of world famous for, for publicizing and uh, ministering to the persecuted church and what they're going through. I started reading through this copy. This is not my report. This is the actual book this morning, and it's been, it's been updated. It's been updated with stories not just from the ancient church or the medieval church or the early modern church, but with stories from the church today. I was reading a story this morning of a pastor who was, was faced with the threat of arrest and, and torture by the police, and they burst into his home as he and his wife and his six children were there, and they had just finished reading and reciting and praying the 23rd Psalm, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right? And they, they begin to, he said this to the, to the officers that were storming into their house, a shadow of a dog can't bite you, and a shadow of death can't kill you. You can kill us or put us in prison, but nothing bad can happen to us. Like, I've never said that. <laughs> There's this sense in which the threat of punishment, if you believe in resurrection, becomes like the shadow of a dog. It can't bite you. It can't, it can't hurt you. And Jesus, I, I believe that Jesus was genuinely fearful in the face of suffering. We see that in the garden where he's sweating and weeping and crying out to God. And yet the threat of punishment doesn't change his testimony. And so the question could be, well, what about us? Um, we don't live in a culture in Oklahoma in 2019 where we generally are particularly fearful of uh, secret police storming into our houses and killing our families because we follow Jesus. That's just not something in Oklahoma that we uh, face on a daily basis. So, so what does this look like for us? I think for one thing, we mentioned this book and, and the ministry of Voice of the Martyrs. One of the things it means is that we remember the suffering of other Christians around the globe. That we realize that there are people like Peter in this passage who are facing the threat of, of violence for their faith. We, we see our lesser examples of marginalization, which do happen even in our culture. We are marginalized in some cases for being Christians. You could be passed over for a promotion 
You could be potentially fired in certain circumstances. You could face any number of forms of, of marginalization. We see our lesser examples or lesser cases of marginalization, ridicule, feeling ostracized in light of other people's sacrifice. We see that in light of the individual, the family that I cited earlier, who is facing something more serious, and we, we leverage that to give us boldness in the face of our own forms of marginalization. We remember the suffering of others, and we see our own marginalization in the light of their, in their sacrifice. I, I went to public school. I mentioned that twice today. You might be like, does not surprise me. <laughs> but I remember what it felt like to be called preacher's kid, right? I remember what it felt like to be marginalized in small ways because I was a Christian, um, I, I remember that, and it was difficult, and I faced absolutely nothing compared to what other people face on a daily basis, but I remember feeling like Peter and just wanting more than anything else to just blend in, to just warm myself by the fire like everybody else, and to not have to bear witness to Jesus, but being a Christian... The very definition of it is to be a witness, Amen. to sit in the seat with Matlock standing over you and say, I'm with him instead of I am not, regardless of punishment, regardless of reward, that our testimony stays the same. And here's the last thing. Here's the most important thing. Bearing witness to Christ, bearing witness to Christ means that when our efforts fail, we don't quit. Being a witness to Christ means that when our efforts fail, we don't quit. I, I was thinking about this passage because Judas, sorry, come back to that. Peter fails. Peter fails repeatedly. I am not. I am not. I am not. He fails repeatedly. And I, I thought about this question. What separates Peter from Judas? Like, what makes them different? We talked about Judas last week as he sells out his buddy Jesus for money. He betrays Jesus for whatever reason. We talked about the different theories, but what separates Peter from Judas? Both of them deny Christ. Both of them deny Christ publicly to the Jewish leaders. Both of them betray their friend. And what separates them is Judas runs for the noose. Judas runs for the hanging tree. And Peter doesn't. I wonder in that moment when Peter says, I am not, I am not, and the rooster crows, like the weight of that crow. And the, the stick, Peter, you failed. You, 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 everybody would be better off if you weren't here. Some of you have heard that voice in your head. Your family, your friends would be better off if you weren't here. You failed. And for whatever reason, Judas runs for the tree, the noose, and Peter doesn't. In fact, if we read on in the gospel story, Peter not only runs to Jesus, Peter swims to Jesus. He jumps out of a boat because he can't get to the risen Jesus fast enough. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't quit, despite the fact that he failed to be a good witness. He failed on the stand, so to speak. I, I rarely get to see any movies uh, that don't have to do with animated animals that, you know, sing. <laughs> But recently, uh, because of you know, the miracle of Apple TV or whatever, uh, Brianna and I actually got to watch a movie. And I'm not necessarily endorsing this movie, and I'm also not going to spoil this movie. So it's a very, you know, walking a dicey tightrope here. Um, but it was a movie called uh, A Star is Born. Some of you maybe have seen it with Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga. And it's a famous remake of an old, old movie. But it's a gritty movie. It's, it's not a kid's movie. And it deals with some of these adult issues like addiction and shame, 
and this question of whether or not your loved ones would be better off if you weren't here. And without spoiling the movie, Bradley Cooper faces this very sort of like Peter versus Judas moment. And you see him holding a belt and wrestling with, do I run to the tree like Judas? Or do I run to something else? And there's this, this, this war that goes on with, within us when we fail. I heard a pastor say, you tell a Christian, the way you tell a Christian, you've heard me say this before, it's by what they do after they sin. Christians still fail. We, we break on the stand. We say, I am not. But what a Christian does after they fail is they know that the only place to run is to Jesus. We don't reach for the belt or the rope. We reach for the cross. And we find in the cross the only encouragement, the only grace that there is for people who have been poor witnesses, people like me, on the stand. And in that moment when the Spirit works inside of us, our public self and our private self are healed by the blood of Jesus. Maybe today, what you need to hear is not some just like in your face, get it together, mister, your private self, you know. Maybe what you need to hear today is very simple. Don't quit. Don't quit. Peter failed. He didn't quit. God still had some stuff for him. He did okay. You can be okay too. Your public self, your private self, you can bear witness if you don't quit. Imagine if there were a whole group of people in Bartlesville who decided they were going to reach for the cross instead of the rope, who decided that they were going to begin to point to Jesus in really simple ways, that they would be spurred on by the example of people like the martyrs I mentioned earlier that suffered more intensely than we will ever dream of. And we begin to point to Jesus here, here in Bartlesville. What, what could happen in our families, our schools, our churches, our, our workplaces, cubicle world? What could happen in our, in our play dates, in our relationships, in Little League? If we said, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to be a, a witness for Jesus. That's, that's my prayer for us. Let's pray.